you can give me an actual specific variety, but what attributes of that cotton are you looking for? Are you looking for uh, more determinant, less determinant, tall, big? What are you looking for when you're selecting your variety? I guess I'll be first up since I got the microphone up. Um, it, it, we've kind of just gotten on this deal, and I, my original thought was, you know, a little bit more determinate plant, uh, shorter clay is what I would have said, and, you know, want to maybe easier to manage. Uh, but the two varieties I had last year, uh, that kind of proved to be the opposite. You know, my 2498, I would say, was less so than that. Then I had some 1621. 1621 is about the shortest one they got. And the 2498 is, you know, one of the right past mid on it and the, the 2498 beat my 1621 everywhere I had it yield wise and grade wise um, and I never would have thought that I mean the 1620 stacked on a bunch of bowls and so and the 2498 didn't seem to do that uh, but it ended up being better and so it a couple of things it number one I don't really know uh, what what the answer to that is I mean two I'm really bad at guessing what cotton is going to yield um, until we get there I've, every year I think I've got it figured out and I've got some new parameter or metric that, oh, well, now it's bowl size is what it is. I've got bigger, you know, diameter bowls. And maybe that plays into it, but, or maybe it's the, maybe the bowl is just thicker. I don't know. I'm on the outside and it wasn't full of fiber. Um, so I don't really have a good uh, answer for you, I guess. But, uh, you know, at least maybe one that's not as hard to control with picks to start with, you know, might be a good spot to look. But really just kind of in trial and error. Yeah, on that, I've, I guess I've grown, I was just trying to count while he was finishing up. I've grown six different varieties on, on 80s, seven. Um, and I, I see them making, and I know Clay Dusty's probably seen this, and I, I've seen them make more, they compensate in their own way, in my opinion. You know, so I've, I've had the 1820, which just seems to be the ultimate, but the stand is the problem. So. You know, if you have a skip, well, here, I'll just put on a whole nother plant and, you know, slow your stripper down so you have to get out. But then I've planted 2398, and I thought, oh, what did I do? And it was just a stovepipe. Well, it, ended, it made more cotton than the 1820 in a different way. So I thought that was interesting. And, and by 100 pounds, and it had an average of 90 to 95 bowls on it, while the 1820 had 160. So I just think there's a lot of ways, and it just knows. You know, scientifically, I have no idea, but that, that's kind of what I've seen. I've, uh, 1909, 1830, 2574, and 1621 are the ones that I've grown, in addition to those other two. All right, who's next with a question? I'll ask one. Lacey. I want to ask you on, uh, you were talking about your, your uh, calves, calves that you're raising. Are you actually grass finishing those? And are you GAP certified in going to Whole Foods? Yes, I am GAP certified every 18 months. I get to do it all again. Uh, but I've been doing it for 15 or 17 years. I don't know, somewhere in there. So I know I'm really good. We show up, we do everything quite quickly. We are 100% grass fed and finished all the way through. We are all natural, not organic. Um, I do believe in vaccinating cattle. Um, if we do have to um, doctor one, then we notch their tag and take them out of, of that system. But due to the way that we run them and the fact that we are a completely closed herd, we rarely have issues. And um, most of the time we can take care of it uh, in an all natural way um, with different um, all natural things that it just, the fact that we've been grass fed for so long, or grass, just completely grass only, um, their rumen changes and you're not stressing them like you used to. I did like what you said about using um, cattle as a tool that's what we do with them. We use them as a tool a lot, and then we just happen to sell them as well. So l let me ask you this, and what is your timeline on m just an average timeline from a calf from the day it, it's born to the day it's ready for slaughter with just grass? We don't push them. Um, I typically... The guy who I sell to is C.R. Freeman out of Lone Wolf, Oklahoma. He 
is who is between me and Whole Foods. Um, we've worked together 15, 17 years, I don't know, for a long time. Um, Cavanus processes all of Whole Foods um, cattle for Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. And so whenever CR is sending a semi-load to Cavanus to be processed, and I have a semi-load ready to go, I say, hey, pick me up on this day. That way I don't pay for shipping either, and they're not deadheading back to Oklahoma. Um, I don't know how long CR... It just kind of depends on what's going on in the market. Um, like right now, I'm setting on, I'm trying to think how old those calves are. They would be coming on 15 or 16 months old. I mean, there's some big boys. Um, but then again, I'm getting paid to feed them and on Dean's wheat, so <laughs> I don't really mind. Um, it just depends. We really don't push them ever, and CR doesn't push them. We just kind of let them do their thing. Sorry, it's not much of an answer. But I'm that way with our pigs, too. Um, we utilize pigs to clean up land, and we don't push anything. We have one here. This question's for Stephen. As a farmer in Terry and Gaines County in that sandy land, if your water goes, can a farmer survive with just cattle and dry land cotton? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, especially if the land isn't paid for. So we're racing a clock, especially for me. If I buy ground now, can I, can I figure it out before the water runs out? And uh, it's, it's hard to see, but I think we can. It's, it's, the margins are going to be tight. I won't be driving a new tractor anytime soon. Uh, but I think there is a way forward. We just, it's going to take some work. It's going to take rotation, I think. I had a, one of the farmers we've combined peanuts for. He told me, you know, we'll get a good dry land year once every three or, you know, once every four to five years we'll get a good dry land crop. Well, to me that just means that four out of five years we're planting the wrong crop in that season. So I think just being able to be versatile, maybe, maybe it may be harvest wheat. Um, that 20 inch wheat, it's kind of that I've got the radishes in right now. I know wheat's not the ideal cereal for a cover, but it leaves my options open. If, if the wheat, you know, we've got some good moisture now. I've, I dug the other day, we've got about 36 inches of moisture underneath. I think we're okay. I'm hoping we'll get a dry land wheat crop off of it. Numbers work a lot better at nine dollars a bushel than they do at four fifty. But if I can cut, you know, twenty bushels off of that, that'll make me what my insurance will guarantee on dry land cotton. So I'm just gonna let it sit through the summer. I'll take a bird in the hand versus two in the bush and we'll just kinda play it by ear. Um, the landowners I work with, um, they're great, they're they're open minded, they uh, they kinda let me do what what we need to do and and I'm really fortunate in that experience, or in that instance, but I think there is a way forward. I hope there is, because I want to keep doing what I'm doing, because I'm having fun, and it's a good, a good lifestyle to raise my kids in. Thank you. Just an observation from looking back in history, the, the land that I farmed down in Borden County was raised by an old gentleman that ran a two and two row crop pattern and he put black eyed peas in the two blanks and uh, he made a living with no subsidy and during the 50s as I recall he missed three crops and he had the ability to pay off on the fourth. Uh, that doesn't seem to be an option in these days but at a dollar twenty cotton to a dollar fifty to two dollars I think the governmental support needs to shift to international markets and protecting us there. We can survive as the older generation did if the markets support us. Uh, the other question I kind of had for Dr. Zach and, and, and maybe Gary, uh, I, I am the soil butcher according to RN, but I'm a skinner, not a cutter. 
I skin it an inch and a half to two inches deep. Are we in the organic industry? Is that the best way to go for the soil life? I have to deal with the weeds somehow, but I'm trying to go as shallow as possible. Is there any other ideas uh, of how we can, you know, protect the soil in an organic fashion? Yeah, I think a couple of things you're talking about, that, that shallow area and skinning it over. I think the other thing we got to realize that you guys are going to have to look at things a little bit different because water moves and leaves your ground by capillary action until you change structure. So if you can scarf like they use in the Dakotas, they got those big noble blades that are 30 inches wide and there's a couple inches deep. I got involved in a big project in South Dakota. And so then they got that, that stops your water from losing by putting a blanket on top. And I don't think, I think the proof of the pie is always in the pudding. So if you say, well, does that system really work? You see, what we've been doing, we're quite satisfied with how it works. And so if I got into, if I did that and it, it, something didn't seem to be working, what is the reason for it not working? I don't believe it's that shallow incorporating. I was talking to Dr. LaSalle when he was leaving here. How do you think he does his garden? Shallow incorporating. You know, so I, I think we got a lot of things to learn. I think that blanket on top of your ground and breaking capital action is going to save a lot of moisture. But what comes down has got to get in. But I think that's by monitoring it over time to see how it goes. So let me ask you a question. In, in response to how you farm, is it till or no till? It's very shallow till. So, okay, so it is very shallow till. Uh, I don't rip or break. Okay. I mean, see, um, cover crops or bare? Okay, so you, and it's cover, cover between the rows. Spread a rye crop in September with a radish mix. Okay, okay, but when you put cotton down or something, <laughs> what's between the rows? We'll clean till in March or April ahead of cotton. Okay, and and this goes back to Arian said something about um, you know microclimates and whatnot. One of the things that you got to realize about microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi. Um, and soil is there is a depth profile to where they really are and if you go and look at the literature I mean microbes will go down 10 12 feet they'll, they'll follow the roots all the way down I mean if you look at mesquite if mesquite has a root down to the Ogallala aquifer those microbes are down with it and they're doing things with the plant no matter how deep that root is the microbes are going to follow them down one of the problems around here, and Gary doesn't have the, Gary has the alternate problem in Wisconsin, because of our climate, because of our aridity, uh, and because of winter temperatures, that soil component does have active microbes in it doing things to the plant and for the plant and acting on that carbon that is different than what's done seven inches. And so part of the difficulty is that with him, He's dealing with cold temperatures he has to deal with. with. With us, we're dealing with hot temperatures all year round. And, and part of the problem is almost, in fact, all the microbes that are important in soils are like us. They're what are called mesophiles. They, they are active and they, their optimum temperatures for us, for them, are somewhere between 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If you start getting above them, they start to shut down. Now, that doesn't mean that what you're doing is detrimental, all that, it's, all that it's indicating is that even though you're doing it shallow, a lot of the carbon at the scale with which they process it that's sitting on that gets recycled there first before it's brought down deeper in terms of earthworms and, and the roots of plants as they first start out. So there is a recovery. Now what that really means here is unclear. I would say, you know, some shallow tillage is probably okay. Um, but the, the big challenge is not to leave any of that surface open because as that surface during the day gets to 120 degrees in, in July or August, that's really detrimental. And the microbes all the way down have to recover to that temperature. I guess I got a question, not an answer, I think is I'm not from these parts of the world. I'm really glad where I'm from when I come other parts and it's really a struggle. I'm like, I suddenly go home, you say, wow, yeah, cultural shock. But then when it rains, whenever that rain comes, does it all soak in or are you losing some? I was in places where they get such little rain and it's running off. I said, I'd be out there with a five gallon bucket, pitching it back uphill. Does all the rain soak in? 
uh, a follow-up, if you don't mind. Uh, the temperature control, can we reduce population in a solid plant to have shading and reach some of the goals and also, uh, I'm thinking less than 10,000 on a solid plant and get the, some of the benefits from the, the wide row cotton, but have a shading. You know, and it goes back to something that, that's, that keeps coming up in terms of whether you're planning on 40 inch center, 60 or, or 80. Where are the roots? Where are the roots and all that? Because the plants are also responding to that temperature variability and that change. So those roots under the plant that are shaded are doing vastly different things than the plants are between them. And if those temperatures between are too variable and too extreme, they're not gonna do what you think they are. And it goes, so if you have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna base it on an acre basis. If you have an acre and you have so many rows per acre, how much of that soil really is shaded compared to how much that isn't? And around here, you know, I'm, you know, we don't know, as somebody said, you look at 80 inch cotton, you have to have roots between them, but I know from data we've collected at other places around, if, you ha if the variability between rows is too high because of our summer temperatures, there are no roots. And if you irrigate, that water is just gonna sit there and evaporate because the plants can't use it because the temperature is such, you know cotton in its root has to have a certain optimum temperature and it will not grow into that soil, no matter what. And that's the dilemma we face. You know, in Wisconsin, it's too much water. Your tractors are sinking, and then everything's flooded, and then we get into the situation of being anaerobic and losing nitrogen and all that stuff. So we do have a very different, in any arid system, we do have a very different outcome, and, and part of it is to figure out where the optimum, if we, just, if we just look at the rows in a cotton field here, is it sufficient from year to year to make a difference, irrespective of what's happening between the rows? We did a study a couple of years ago at the tech farm, a couple of my grad students, and we looked at what was going, and this was, and this was tilled and bed planted cotton. And we looked at, we looked at the microbial responses and, and in the hills where the plant the cotton versus the furrows. The furrows were always much better. It wasn't where the plants were, it was where the conditions because of shading by the beds made a big difference. You know, and then everybody went to flatbeds. You know, or, 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 and again, no-till works here the way it does, particularly with stubble, because everything's covered. It all looks the same. And that's, and that's, and that's, and that's the benefit. Dr. Zach, at some point you said something about the herbicides all have a negative impact on the soil fungi. I'm assuming that all herbicides are not the same. Uh, are there some classes of chemistry that are worse than others and could you break that down a little bit or they may all be the same I don't know well I, I, I can on some now one of the things you got to also realize is that there are certain groups of fungi that are more susceptible to herbicides than others so unless you, unless you um, completely chemically sterilize your soil you're always going to have fungi in them it's a question of which fungi are, are there. And from my understanding and, and the research that I've looked at, the herbicides that we work with, as, you know, as, as somebody mentioned today with Roundup, it was a, it, it was a fungicide initially and rather than, than a herbicide. These compounds are all designed to mimic hormones in some way, shape, or form. That's what they're designed to do to deal with the plant. But you know what? I don't think, I don't know if whether you realize it or not, the majority of fungi in the soil produce the same hormones that plants do. That's why they interact with the roots. That's how the plants and them communicate back and forth. Plants produce hormones that interact with the fungi. The fungi produce hormones that interact with the plants. And they're the same ones. And that's how the systems evolve. The problem is when we apply herbicides, no matter what they are, they mimic they mimic hormones, they mimic plant hormones. And as a consequence of that, the fungi, it's like us in antibiotics. Antibiotics produced by bacteria and fungi are not designed, 
are not designed to kill them. They're chemical signals to tell them what's going on. It's just we discovered that we can use them as microbial sides and kill the staph that's in us or, 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 or our pneumonia. We overwhelm them with their own signals. And that's the same thing that's going on with pigweed, right? Pigweed and all the chemicals that no longer respond to Roundup and everything else because they figured out how to deal with those, those signals and prevent them from, from doing things they shouldn't be doing. But a fungus cannot communicate with a plant unless it's producing signals that the plant understands and also responds to. And we've mimicked that in all the chemicals we do. Now, I would have to say the only thing that I know of above ground that will not interfere with um, the activity of fungi is insecticidal soap. It's just soap sprayed on your plants. Somebody this, somebody this morning said milk powder, right? It works on squash. You want to you want to get rid you want to get rid of some mildew. You put milk powder on. You know what it does? It changes the pH, so the organisms can't do it. But it doesn't affect them directly. It just changes pH. And so. I mean, there's a lot of rich understanding of naturally occurring compounds that we, we should use, but we don't. You know? I mean, that's why garlic is, tastes what it does, and that's why mint tastes what it does. Those are antimicrobial and anti-feeding compounds. Uh, all kind of really interesting. Now, that's why this thing about fungal or, or bacteria dominated. I say, are there some indicators here? What's going to happen when they test nutrient density of foods? They're looking for... Uh, right now, there's a lab in Iowa. It's $1,200 to get one sample tested, but they test 4,000 compounds. And they're looking for indicators that would indicate nutrient density. And you might end up with four compounds, and eventually, I said, that's really nutrient dense. So, on our soils, when we used to milk 300 cows and had 600 acres, we made five cuttings of hay. All the corn stalks got baled for bedding. Nothing complex stayed on the land. We had sand bedding for the cows, and, and so, and we paid grazed them down below here, and so we, our earthworm population kept going down, 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 down. And I remember from years and years ago, of Kerry Reams in 1970 said, if your soil is truly bacteria dominated, your earthworms won't, well, population won't survive. We never fed them. So now all the rye straw, all the stuff out there, the earthworm population exploded. I didn't have to reintroduce them because now I'm feeding them. Is that, is that probably the same for the fungal populations? So if I'm, the feed that I feed the earthworms is complex carbons. That's the same thing the fungal population wants. So is that an indicator? My take is yes. I mean, so when I first got into this, we were part of a larger group. I did my PhD in, in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, which most of you know. And at the time, this was in the, the mid-70s. One of the projects that was going on worldwide is how do you reestablish biological activity in soils that have been disturbed? That was this question out of the 70s. And we were involved in some. And basically, you need two things. You need recalcitrant carbon that's slow to degrade because it's the fun, that's what the fungi work on. And as was, what Tim's been saying, you need nutrients. You have to add some nutrients because once you start that trajectory and move it forward, it's microbially, it's extremely difficult to change it once it starts, unless you go in and restart the whole thing over again. So what we were looking at is, if you have soils that are degraded in some way, shape, or form, what do you need to add, how much do you need to add, and how are you going to look at this stuff over time? And make sure it's on the right trajectory, and then the biological processes will take over. I got a question um, over here. So Gary, I noticed on a table you put up uh, on your presentation, and you can answer this, or Dr. Zach, or any of y'all that want to chime in. Um, I noticed the, from your 2012 data, and then the average, and then your current stuff, on the pH, I think it went from like a 6.2 to a 7. So that raised it. And you know, and, and most people in this room, you know, probably got pHs closer to 8 and wanting to drop it. So in these kind of practices, can you lower the pH? And if yes, how much and how quick? Yeah, you're right. It was very observant. My pHs did go up. Now, that's a, we're on 14 different farms, and so I took a sample from each farm, so it's probably not a very replicate okay, research gotcha. kind of thing. But you're right. Our pH has gone up. You see, here's the whole thing. Uh, some of the farms we got, we buy, the pHs are quite low, and then because conventional farming, putting on chlorides and putting on a lot of nitrogen, it drops their pHs because it removes calcium. So anyway, that's so. Here's my thing: 
Biology out-trumps chemistry any day of the week. And so Earthworm wants the pH to be 772. And so someone said, so naturally, because we're organic and our inputs are zero, everything is there is what's a natural system. I agree that ones that got eight pHs, that's a real problem because you have a real struggle to get phosphorus uptake. And I said it was mycorrhizae's fault. Uh, it can't live in that kind of a climate. So, but that pH is seven, seven, two with lots of life in the soil. Now, if your life in the soil is totally dead, then the chemistry-wise, those trace minerals show up much higher at a lower pH. But if, so if I'm going to move to a higher pH, I can't stop that pH. Now, if I got an 8, that's a struggle. I'd like to be able to reduce it, and that's not easy to do. Usually that's dry land, and there's all kinds of other issues. But to have a, our soils go from a 6, 2 to a 7, our crops exploded, our mineral uptake got really much higher, because now we're a biological system, not a chemistry system. So one of the things, too, that you've got to keep in mind is microbes operate at much different scales in soil than what we think. So when we measure pH, we're measuring the pH of the bulk soil. That's really what it is. But within pores in the soil around here, there's pH that's going to be 6, it's going to be 5, it's going to be 7, because the bacteria and fungi, as they interact with the carbon that's in the soil, are actually pumping out organic acids as part of their natural process. And so while the bulk soil may be maybe an 8, 8.2 here, you're going to, um, otherwise we wouldn't have phosphorus availability. We wouldn't have a lot of things that go on because phosphorus as those pHs shouldn't be available even if you put it in there, but it is, which means that on, on, on the micro scale, the microbes are doing the things that are keeping phosphorus with the plants and the roots available. And our question, and, th and that's why for us, and that's why when you see numbers, Soil structure and soil tilth is so important. You have good soil structure, you have good soil tilth, you're going to have that complexity of pH values across the soil. I mean, we have so much calcium here, it's, it's, it's well buffered. You're not going to change the pH of the whole bulk soil. You simply can't do it. But the roots, the interactions with the microbes, the, the protozoans and nematodes that are grazing everything and contributing to those acidic conditions are what regulates the, the plant. That's the scale at which they operate. That's, but again, it's complex because it's temperature driven here. And that's part of, that's part of the dynamic. That's why uniform, a solid cover is the most important. I don't want to monopolize anything. It's really interesting. It's soil testing. People try to make everything a religion, whether it's a sap test, a soil test. We were in Arizona and the soil sodium levels were 14. At 14 parts per million percent sodium, you not, should not go alfalfa. So Dr. Philip Barak is a professor in Madison, and I got back and said, how can this alfalfa grow so beautifully in Arizona when the, when the sodium levels are 14? And he said, uh, you took your soil and you took a sample and you ran it through a blender. Soils aren't like that. There's pockets in those soils that aren't 14% sodium that are much less than the alfalfa roots just don't go in those things. You've got, so you've got to realize that it don't make that into a religion because I was so convinced that alfalfa should not live in that world. Same thing you were saying. I was thinking last night, like you have 16 head of cattle. I have typically 200 head of heifers because we don't breed anything until they're getting close to three. If you would like to run a few cattle, um, not a lot, but the secret to running cattle in a no-till um, system is management. Management is key. But if you would like to try I'd be interested in visiting with you and see if we can make something work with the benefits of adding animals back into that system without you having to own them and stuff. Um, it really is amazing what it does and stuff, but anyway, just an idea. I have a question for Tate. On your 80 inch grain sorghum, did you notice was the plant height taller than like it, where the 40 inch sor sorghum was? And did you still feel like you had the same amount of biomass there basically after you combined it? Uh, yes and no. Uh, early on it looked the same. It took a long time really. To, I would say it was probably August before you could see, early August before you could start to see it uh, you know, compensate and, and uh, you know, the, really see the tillers. Uh, but no, it wasn't much taller. It just, uh, it was, it was a, it just dense, head density and uh, tillers more than anything. But 
Uh, no, biomass, no, there, there's noticeably less cover there. Going to go back to ancient history, uh, an old saying from the, the older guys down in our neighborhood was plow immediately behind the rain as quick as you can get in. And their thought was is to create an insulating barrier to so that the moisture would not translocate and evaporate. You created an air pocket in that top soil. Uh, I see things in history that are starting to make sense that I heard. Can you all explain part of that process? Was that also keeping the soil cooler with an aerated soil in that top end. I'll uh, answer from what, my perspective. In 1988, our major drought, 2012, our major drought, there were normal crop yields by some farmers. And the ones that did the best are the ones that moldboard plowed alfalfa fairly shallow took that blanket and flipped it over, and I think it stopped the copper action, and it's at the top then was a totally dry, bone dry, but down below, we were able to save the moisture. It was the only thing that we could figure out, too. No, I would say the same thing from, from around here. It goes back to this whole question of a cover. So that bare soil, which is, which is just bare and flat, is going to evaporate quite a bit. It's going to wick it up. But if you flip it over and put some sort of cover on it, it's that cover, whatever has changed, is going to keep that moisture in. That's why it worked. Now, you're going to destroy a lot of stuff doing that. And that's not the type of cover you want, but that's what they were doing. They were just doing a cover. I mean, you know, we used to dig our, our home gardens, too. You flip it over, right, and you, and you, and you keep that moisture in until we, until we discovered, you know, green mulches and everything else worked much better. We have one here. Uh, this question is for Jeff or any of the other producers on the panel. And with the no-till systems, I have questions about phosphorus. And how are you getting phosphorus deep enough so the roots can take advantage of the phosphorus when you're in a no-till system? Especially if you're in a field with residual uh, phosphorus that's pretty low. Let's say 15 parts per million or, or less. We've had a, quite a few guys that have uh, implemented a compost program and have spread it out and left it. And it doesn't make sense, but it appears to be working, at least from some of the testing that we've done uh, where we're picking that up. But they've got to be in that program for years. It's not like you do it once and, and that's it. Uh, the other, there's another group of guys that are doing it on the planter. Uh, and you know placing it with the seed and uh and then the other piece of this is with covers and rotations where we are breaking loose some of that and we're seeing that especially with radishes is what it, where i'm seeing it the, the most and i think what's happening is those exits are um you know lowering the ph so we're releasing some of that natural phosphorus but i'd be curious how some of you other guys are doing it but since phosphorus does not move in the soil, but maybe two inches max, how in the world are you getting it down to where the active root level is because of the water? Zach, no. Oh, you know. I can't answer that. <laughs> well, look, there are two, two aspects of that question, and that's something none of us ever talk about. The first one is, is from a plant perspective. We know plant physiologically, some plants hoard phosphorus. They actually take in more phosphorus than they actually need. Now, whether cotton's one of them, I can't tell you that. But plants, ecologically, some types will hoard phosphorus because, it's so, because it is unavailable. So, the, so you give them, I mean, it's like hoarders, right? If you give them all the phosphorus they want, they will, use it, they will take all that you can give them. It doesn't mean they need them, but they will store it. And you've got to keep in mind, cotton as a perennial, it's the perennials that will do that more than the annuals. They will hoard phosphorus because they never know where they're going to get it again. So they'll store it in granules in their cell vacuoles. So you've got to be aware of that also. 
As far as, as, far as where phosphorus is distributed in, in the soil, again, it goes back to the, there are two processes that go on in terms of phosphorus availability that may not get picked up in an assessment. The microbes around the plant roots are constantly being turned over by small animals, protozoans, nematodes, mites, that consume them and release that phosphorus quickly rather than just dying and taking a while to decompose. So there's always this turnover of phosphorus in those root systems. And that's where the mycorrhizae are. The mycorrhizae are going and exploring, and, you know, as Gary said, that soil volume that those plant roots would never be able to garner into. And so there's always this movement of phosphorus by fungi back and forth from, from the plant. And, you know, the roots you had in the soil last year that, that still have phosphorus in them are being decomposed and being consumed, and they're using that phosphorus. Now, what's interesting about mycorrhizae is they can't use any phosphorus that's not actually usable to the plant. They can't, they can't derive new stuff. They can't degrade rock phosphate. They just can't do that. But they're able to explore a larger volume than any plant root can, and they can translocate at large distances back to the plant. And that's, and that's why oftentimes you'll see these, these plants able to grow where the phosphorus steep down you know, is, is, is low because in the bulk soil it may be low, but they're pulling it from all over the place. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>